Okay, we will introduce uh, Professor Dr. Deniz Ersouz, Hasitip uh, University, Turkey. Uh, the lecture is pulmonary manifestation of cystic fibrosis. Dear Chair and dear colleagues, first of all, I'd like to thank very much to the organizing committee for inviting me to this Congress. I am really very proud to be here with you. So cystic fibrosis is actually a very ancient disease because we see that in the 17th century, a Spanish professor of, of medicine wrote that a child who tastes salty when kissed on the forehead is cursed and will soon die. So cystic fibrosis was first identified nearly 80 years ago in patients with recurrent pneumonia and salt loss. And in the 1950s, the median life expectancy of those patients was just a few months. And the main causes of that were meconymileus and malnutrition. However, today, the survival of patients with CF has improved dramatically because of early diagnosis and improved treatments. So cystic fibrosis is a metabolic disorder which is characterized by the dysfunction of the exocrine glands of the sweat glands and pancreas and mucous glands of the respiratory, gastrointestinal and reproductive tracts. And the only mode of inheritance is autosomal recessive. So we know about the cystic fibrosis gene. It's located on the long arm of chromosome 7. And until now, more than 2,000 mutations in this gene have been reported. And the most common one is Delta F508, especially in the Northern European countries. So we know, a little, we, we know so much about the cystic fibrosis pathogenesis. We know that uh, CF gene calls for, for a protein, which is called as cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator protein, CFTR protein. And the CFTR protein is located on the apical membranes of the respiratory epithelia, the pancreas, sweat glands, hepatobiliary system, intestines, and the reproductive system. So CFTR protein itself is a chloride channel. And it's activated by ATP. And also, it also regulates other chloride channels, regulates sodium and potassium channels, and has other complex uh, activities like intracellular acidification or transport of some intravesicle, intracellular vesicles. And there are more than 2,000 mutations, and those mutations are classified into five groups, actually. And more recently, group five and six mutations uh, have been defined. Patients who have group one, class one, two, and three mutations are considered to have a more severe phenotype. However, patients with group uh, mutations, group uh, four, five, and six, are considered to have a less severe uh, phenotype. So what happens in the pulmonary disease and cystic fibrosis is that this is respiratory epithelia, and this is not working. And this is respiratory fluid, normal respiratory fluid. And cystic, in cystic fibrosis, CFTR is not working. If you have a normal CFTR channel, then there is ion, normal ion transport. And as a result, there is normal sodium chloride and normal water in airway surface liquid. However, if CFTR is not working, the reabsorption of chloride is blocked. Besides, there is hyper uh, absorption of sodium. And therefore, uh, water uh, follows sodium, and therefore, so, uh, water is so much reabsorbed, so there is just little sodium, little chloride, and little water in airway surface liquid, which makes the airway surface liquid very thick, viscous, and hard to clear. And besides the ion transport defect, we see that uh, there is excessive bacterial binding in the cell, there is reduced bacterial uh, uptake uh, because of CFTR defect, and there is impaired bacterial still proteins in the respiratory epithelia. So we can summarize that in the pathogenesis of CF is that the lungs are considered to be normal at birth, but some authors say that there is plugging and distension of some submucosal gland ducts, and in the newborn period, there is no bacteria in the lungs of patients with CF. However, because of ion transport I, tra I mentioned, there are some mucous abnormalities, and as a result, there is the respiratory tract becomes persistently infected with some kind of microorganisms. And as a result, there is exaggerated inflammation in the lungs, 
which causes progressive lung damage and decline in lung functions, and, is, and uh, unfortunately, as a result, patients die because of respiratory failure. So pulmonary infection in cystic fibrosis is different from pulmonary infection in healthy people because uh, those um, pulmonary infections uh, occur because of Staph aureus and Haemophilus influenza when patients are younger. However, when they grow older, they are become chronically colonized with Pseudomonas aeruginosa and especially uh, some uh, uh, severe bacteria like uh, Bucolderia sepasia complex, Acromobacteria, and non tuberculous mic microbacteria. And methicillin resistant staph aureus and some mucoid strains of Pseudomonas aeruginosa are very dangerous for pneumonia in patients with cystic fibrosis. So, inflammation in cystic fibrosis lungs is very characteristic because they are rich in neutrophils and they are rich in pro inflammatory mediators like IL 1 and IL 8. So there is massive influx of neutrophils, and there is increased amount of neutrophil elastase and other kind of neutrophil-derived um, materials. So as the disease progresses in cystic fibrosis, the airway lumen is filled with neutrophil exudates and lots of inflammation, and bronchiectasis takes place, especially in the upper lobes of patients. And there can be segmental hyperinflation or atelectasis because of airway obstruction, there is increased susceptibility to pneumothorax, and patients can present with hemoptysis because of hypertrophied bronchial arteries, and unfortunately because of severe hypoxia, patients may present with pulmonary hypertension and core pulmonale. Upper airways are also in, 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 included in, upper airway disease can be seen in cystic fibrosis also. It's very characteristic that children ha may have nasal polyps or chronic rhinosinusitis. And lung disease is the major cause of mortality and morbidity in CF. And it's very important that pulmonary disease develops over a variable time, of course, so it's progressive. In neonates, in the newborn period, generally there are no respiratory symptoms. However, in infants, they present with tachypnea, wheezing, recurrent infections, and in older children, very characteristically, present with productive cough, exercise intolerance, and sputum production and bronchiectasis. So it's very characteristic that CF patients have intermittent acute pulmonary exacerbations, which are characterized by increased respiratory symptoms like cough, dyspnea, and fatigue, fever, and they have decreased pulmonary function. And they may have, some may have uh, airway hyperreactivity, especially to exercise, histamine, and metacholine. There is also another complication of pulmonary manifestation CF. They may have allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, which is an immunologic response to surface colonization with aspergillus fumigatus, and patients are characterized by wheezing and cough, which is refractory to standard therapies. And you can see the diagnostic criteria of allergic bron bronchopulmonary aspergillosis in CF. And in chest X-ray or CTs, you can see that they have pulmonary consolidation and central bronchiectasis. This is a baby with CF who has bilateral hyperinflation and some chronic changes. However, this is an older patient with CF with excessive uh, hyperinflation plus widespread bronchiectasis all over the lungs. So for the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis, there has to be, the golden standard is sweat chloride concentration, a sweat chloride test. And evidence demonstrating the importance of early diagnosis in CF has led to the development of CF newborn screening. So CF newborn screening have some advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are, is that it has been shown that uh, the Early diagnosis in CF correctly uh, uh, treats the pancreatic insufficient patients. It has positive effect on height and weight. Uh, patients who are diagnosed earlier have better lung function and lower CF mortality risk. However, it may have some uh, advantages as well because there may, there may be some false positive, uh, false positive results which cause parental anxiety and there can be inconclusive results which I'm going to talk later. So you can see that there are lots of countries, and especially in Europe, who are doing newborn screening for CF, and Turkey has started uh, making 
uh, newborn CF screening in 2050. And there are some different protocols in CF uh, newborn screening, but we can say that it generally starts with uh, an immunoreactive trypsinogen measurement when the babies are born, and they all end up with sweat tests. And in some protocols, they do a second IRT, and in some protocols, they do CFTR mutation analysis, and some do CFTR mutation analysis plus again in IRT, but they all end up with sweat tests. So nowadays, we see that there are different kinds of CF phenotypes. One of them is the classical CF, and in this classical CF, we know the classical diagnosis that there should be at least one clinical phenotype plus one laboratory finding. And these characteristic phenotypes are in infants generally uh, present with failure to thrive steatore or rectal prolapsus or meconiomyleus. When they become older children, they present with recurrent pneumonia, steatore, recurrent polyps. And when they are adults, they may present with azospermia, chronic sinusitis, focal biliary cirrhosis. So in classical CF, most are uh, diagnosed with neonatal screening and no symptoms in the uh, newborn period. However, there is another phenotype called as atypical cystic fibrosis, and these patients do not present with the full spectrum of clinical features of classical cystic fibrosis. They generally have only one uh, symptoms like only pancreatitis, only bronchiectasis, only infertility. And there is another uh, characteristic finding in CF. It is called a CFTR-related metabolic syndrome. These are babies uh, which, uh, who are diagnosed with newborn screening. They have uh, elevated immunoreactive trypsinogen level in their heel prick test. However, a CF diagnosis cannot be uh, confirmed because they may either have a normal sweat chloride and two CFTR mutations, or they may have intermediate sweat chloride, one and no CFTR mutations. So you can see the classification of CFTR mutations in CFTR2 website as CF causing mutations, mutations with um, no clinical consequences like this. So these patients, the majority of CF related metabolic syndrome infants will remain well and have no long term uh, health problems. However, uh, long, more long data are needed to see whether they will become CF or atypical CF patients. So CF phenotype is very complicated. It depends on the CFTR mutation, the modifier genes, and the lifestyle. For example, lungs of CFTR patients, uh, cystic fibrosis patients are so much influenced by the modifier genes and the environment and just a little bit influenced by the genotype. However, pancreatic insufficiency mostly depends on the uh, mutations of cystic fibrosis patients. And now let's move on to the treatment of pulmonary disease and cystic fibrosis. Until now, we have been doing conventionally symptom-based treatments, which focus on mucus plugging, infection, inflammation, and nutritional support. Uh, however, if you do this treatment, you can see that patients progress to respiratory failure if you do not make a lung transplantation. So today, newer approaches which target the basic defect in CFTR are so much promising. So this is the pathogenesis of cystic fibrosis. You see that today what we are doing is that in order to decrease the bronchial obstruction, we, use, um, uh, we decrease the mucous viscosity, we uh, uh, augment the clearance by recombinant human DNAs, hypertonic saline, and chest physiotherapy. In order to decrease the infection, treat the infection, we use antibiotics, either intravenous, oral, or inhaled. And to decrease the inflammation, we use anti-inflammatory drugs. And for bronchiectasis, uh, we need to do the lung transplantation. This is the symptom-based treatment. However, in order to uh, do, uh, provide a normal gene, uh, gene therapy should be done. In order to uh, Increase the surface, uh, surface CFTR, a CFTR modulating drug should be used, and uh, uh, as there is abnormal airway surface liquid, we should restore airway surface liquid with some kind of osmotic agents. So the new treatments target the basic defects in CFTR. They target defective CFTR, uh, uh, epithelium sodium uh, channels, and other uh, channels as well. You see the uh, new treatments here. 
So CFTR modulators especially are very promising nowadays in pre uh, treatment of CF, which target specific defects which are caused by mutations in the CFTR gene. These are potentiators, correctors, and the drugs which correct M, uh, uh, mRNA. So CFTR modulators are some kinds in CF patients uh, because potentiators increase the activity of CFTR and correctors increase the quantity of CFTR. And there are some combination therapies of correctors plus potentiators, which both increase the density of CFTR plus increase the channel opening at the surface area. So there are, until now, there are only three drugs which are currently licensed in CFTR. Ivacaftor, Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor combination, and Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor combination. And they are at various stages of approval for young children. For example, Ivacaftor is the first approved CFTR modulator drug who have uh, mutations, uh, especially class 3 mutations, but nowadays it's uh, licensed in, for example, in US in 32 different of class 4 and 5 mutations. And it's licensed for different ages in different countries. And um, another drug, licensed drug, is a combination treatment, Lumacaftor plus Ivacaftor therapy. It is especially licensed for patients who are homozygous for Delta F508 mutation. And finally, Tezacaftor Ivacaftor treatment is again a combination therapy, is licensed for patients who are carrying those mutations you can see on the slide. So CFTR modulators aim to improve the function of defective CFTR protein, but they are effective only for some certain patients who carry some certain mutations. And in those patients, it has been shown that they improve the lung function, they improve the survival of the patients, they decrease the respiratory symptoms, they decrease the inflammation in clinical trials. There are also some pharmacological strategi strategies under investigation today, which increase the amount of CFTR at the cell membrane, which overread the premature stop columns and which bypass the CFTR channel. And plus, gene therapy, gene editing, and um, mRNA repair is also being uh, under investigation for CF patients. Actually, gene therapy, there have been lots of clinical treatments about uh, gene therapy, but the results are very disappointing. So there is still not an FDA-approved gene therapy in cystic fibrosis. This is the only um, article I can find about uh, placebo-controlled CFTR gene therapy. The blue lines are the patients who had uh, gene therapy, and you can see the red lines are the patients with placebo with no gene therapy. The patients with gene therapy had much better pulmonary function tests when compared to the other patients. Actually, a true gene therapy would be with permanent correction of the genome level, which is called that gene editing. It's still in early stages in cystic fibrosis, but there are some promising data, in vitro data. So there are still some challenges to correct the basic defect in every patient in cystic fibrosis because they, are, they should be used lifelong, they are very expensive, and there are still many patients who are not eligible for CFTR treatment. And until now, we have been using personalized medicine in cystic fibrosis, which is directed at the, uh, which is directed at the symptoms of each patient. However, today, precisional treatment for cystic fibrosis is very important because it is the treatment according to the individual variability in genes, environment, and lifestyle for each person. So there are lots of studies about some new treatments in cystic fibrosis. You see there are lots, uh, there are lots of other CFTR modulators in the pipeline in phase one, phase two, and phase three studies. You see some other drugs too. There are some new drugs under investigation to increase the mucociliary clearance, and there are some new drugs for anti-inflammatory effects, and there are some new antibiotics, especially inhaled antibiotics, which are still under investigation in phase two and phase three studies. So when we look at the survival of the patients with CF in the uh, 1980s, the survival was only uh, until 20 years of age. However, today we know that a, new pa a patient who is born uh, now will live up to their 40s, uh, 40 years. So as a summary, I can say that 
Pulmonary disease in cystic fibrosis is because of defective function of the epithelial ion uh, channels and impaired mucociliary clearance because of CF mutations in the CF gene. And airways are susceptible to endobronchial bacterial infection and there is intense inflammatory inf uh, inflammation which leads to bronchiectasis and respiratory failure. Early diagnosis and early intervention in cystic fibrosis is very important to improve the survival and decrease the respiratory morbidity and mortality. Newborn screening has a positive effect on short and long clinical outcomes. And treatment with CFTR modulators is a milestone in the treatment of, in the history of CF, but there is still a major and urgent need for a new and more potent modulator and other therapeutic approaches to treat all CF patients and genomically guided medicine will hopefully lead to dramatic improvements in CF, clinical disease and survival in the next decades. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much to Professor Dennis for your excellent presentation about the pulmonary manifestations of cystic fibrosis and all the new lines of treatment which will open a hope for these patients to live a normal life. And the floor is open to discussion if anyone has a question to Professor Dennis. No question? Thank you so much.